are in three all saints in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, saints, we are continuing with uh, our series on how to win souls. So today we are doing part five of that wonderful, wonderful series. Now, saints, in the previous studies, we have been studying on how to prepare the soil, the soil of the heart, uh, preparing it to receive the gospel message. Are you with me? So we've been studying primarily about soil preparation. Today we're going to be studying about the seed. Are you with me? Seed sowing, but particularly the seed itself. We first need to understand the seed before we understand how to sow the seed. Now, for those maybe who are watching, joining us for the first time, let me just explain. We have been having a series where we're studying about evangelism. And we have seen that there is a science to evangelism. So there is a way in which evangelism is done. You don't, you don't just do it anyhow. Are you with me? Uh, and that is why when you read in the book of Mark 3 verse 14, the Bible says, And he ordained twelve that they should be with him, and that he might send them forth to preach. Are you with me? So the disciples, before they were sent forth to preach by Jesus, were told that they had to be with Jesus. And do you know, long, do you know how long they were with Christ? The Bible says that Jesus was with them for three and a half years. Actually, when you calculate the time, you will see that it's three and a half years that he was with them. And then they were ready to go forth to many, many lands as ministers of the gospel. Are you with me? So they were trained because there is a science to soul saving. Now, a very clear quotation I want to mention. Letters and Manuscripts, Volume 21, uh, 1906, Paragraph 18. It says, the soul saving is to be our object and Christ's words are our commission and we are to lay hold of the Savior by faith and we are to put all our capabilities to the task of learning the science of soul saving. Do you hear the saints? So we are told in this quotation that there is a science to soul saving and not only is there just a science but this science is so high that it requires all of our capabilities to be taxed, saints. So we ought not just to take soul saving lightly. It is a science of the highest order. And if we don't put our capabilities to the task of learning the science, we are going to be disappointed with our results, saints. That is why things are continuing as they are. There are many people who are not putting their capabilities to the task of learning the science. Are you with me, saints? And we need to do that. We need to do that. Now, this science we also saw in the Bible, that the science of soul saving is likened to the science of agriculture. Now, there are many verses for this. For example, when you look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, in verse 6, speaking about his efforts, evangel evangelistic efforts in Corinth, Paul says, I sowed the seed, and Apollos did what? He watered. Are you with me? And also, when you just look at the Bible, in the book of Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 3, when it speaks about the work of of conversion in the heart God says so not it says he says break up your fallow ground and so not among thorns are you with me so he says that you need to prepare the soil before the seed is sown so there are many many verses Isaiah 5 verse 7 God refers to the vineyard of the Lord of hosts as the house of Israel so God refers to us his people as his vineyard meaning as his planted garden are you with me saints so this all of this is agricultural language showing that soul saving works very much like agriculture. Are you with me? So we need to study soul saving in the light of agriculture. Now we have been studying about soil preparation. Today we are studying about the seed. Now this is very, very important, saints, because it does not matter how well a soil can be prepared. If you do not plant the desired seed, or rather, if you do not plant the seed of the desired plant, you will not get the desired plant. You cannot expect to be reaping apples at the end of the season. Are you with me? While you have planted an orange seed. Are you with me, saints? So in like manner, if the message that we give to people in our evangelistic efforts is not that which God has told us to give, then the result will not be that which God wants it to be. Are you with me? The Christian experience of those whom we evangelize, it will not be as God would have it to be. And you are going to be in danger of wasting time 
and money because sometimes soul saving it puts you put in a lot of money as well in it are you with me recently we're distributing bibles and you know, we're doing a lot of things and everyone everywhere you, soul saving cannot happen without sacrifice let me just put it like that so you, you, you need to be sure that you're planting the correct seed then. Because if you're not, you're going to be wasting time bought with blood. Are you with me? And money that belongs to God. Very important study this is, saints. Very important study. So today we're going to be looking at the seed. Now, not only that, what, what I also want us to see is uh, the fact that this world, saints, it is passing away very, very soon. There are signs that are taking place even now. That are showing us that saints we are right at the borders of the eternal world i'm telling you the truth now many people don't want to see the signs many people are blinded by the love of the world and many other cares so that those these signs are are not clearly discerned are you with me whatever the case may be saints but we need to wake up i'm telling you the truth we need to wake up the signs that i'm going to show now they are showing us that we are at the end saints. there is no other end except this end we are truly, truly at the end. You know when you read in Acts of the Apostles, page 260, we are told that the signs of, of the end are rapidly fulfilling and the earth is hastening to the time when the Son of Man shall be revealed in the clouds of heaven. Are you with me? Now notice it. It says the signs are rapidly fulfilling. So the signs are moving very quickly. Now, if the signs are moving quickly and you are moving slowly, the crisis is going to find you unprepared. Are you with me, saints? Even if you are moving in the correct direction, someone is chasing you and they are moving fast, but you are moving slow. Even if you are running away from them, we are running in the correct direction. Are you with me? But because of your slow moving pace, they are going to catch up with you and you are going to be sorry you moved so slowly. Saints, when you read in Maranatha page 138, we are told that we who know the truth should be preparing for events that are going to come upon the earth as an overwhelming surprise. Are you with me? So we who know the truth ought not only to be speaking about these events, but we ought to be preparing for them. Don't rest until your character reflects the lovely image of Jesus. Study very carefully the lovely image of Jesus and don't rest until you reflect it, saints. There are so many apostasies going on, even in the highest places. And one of the things that inspiration points out that we ought to be doing, saints, if you don't want to, see, if we don't want to be apostates, if we if we don't want to fall off the train, she says. I think this is in Selected Messages, Book Three. Is it in page one seventy eight? I'll just put it in the screen. But Selected Messages, Book Three. I think it's one seventy eight. We'll see. It says that ministers of the gospel would be powerful men if they kept the Lord always before them and devoted their time to the study of his adorable character. It says if they did this, there would be no apostasies. She says none would be separated from the conference because they have by their licentious behavior disgraced the cause and put Jesus to an open shame. That is what it says. Are you with me? Listen to it. It says if we did this, there would be Few apostasies. Mm -mm, that's not what it says. It says there will be no apostasies. So saints, we need to really study the lovely image of Jesus. And we need to not rest until we reflect that lovely image of Jesus. Also saints, the physical preparation very, very important. We are coming to a time, saints, where we will not be able to buy or sell at any cost. We, we, we are warned. We are warned. Do you remember the difference between the foolish and the wise virgins? It's not that one didn't prepare and the other was prepared. Mm -mm. Both prepared, but the foolish prepared too late. The foolish only began to prepare when they heard the voice at midnight saying, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Are you with me, saints? So do not delay. Don't move slowly in terms of preparation. God is merciful, holding back the winds. But there comes a time that God will hold them no longer, saints. Because God sees that many of us, as we see his mercy, we begin to doubt. We begin to doubt the warnings that have been given to us. As we see God's forbearance, we begin to doubt. Saints, we are living on borrowed time. The economy has long supposed to be failed. Long now, we are supposed to be in a time where we are like we're on full surveillance. We remember, you remember, I remember during COVID, there were plans to put surveillance like everywhere. 
like all of these vaccine passports and those are surveillance things all of these things are laying the groundwork for the mark of the peace crisis we need to be ready now let me show you this these few events and then we jump to our study the vatican climate summit what is this thing experts i just want to, i'm not going to go deep into it I'm not going to go deep into it because we've looked at it before and this is not, you know, the, the topic that we're looking at now. But I want us to see, saints, that we are at the point where the mark of the beast, saints, is going to be enforced very, very soon. Now, saints, I want to say this before I show the slide. We all know, or we're all supposed to know that there is a very huge connection between uh, climate change and the enforcement of the mark of the beast. There's a very, very huge connection. We even see it in Matthew 24, where in verse 7, you see that there's a lot of climat climatic disasters, where there's nation rising against nation, and then there's also earthquakes in diverse places, which were not previously there. So there is climatic changes. Are you with me, saints? And famines as well. Those are things sometimes that are related with climate as well. Are you with me? And then the next thing in verse 9, the persecution of God's people. Are you with me, saints? So it will also happen in the same way. That is how it happened in the destruction of Jerusalem. And this is how it's going to happen as well. Just before the persecutions begin of God's people. Are you with me, saints? Now, this has been happening for a very long time where God's people are persecuted and the persecution is linked with the climatic disorder. In the times of Elijah and Ahab and Jezebel, there was a drought. And the prophets of God were persecuted because of the drought. Are you with me? It was declared by Jezebel that, you know, the worshippers of Jehovah, particularly the prophets, are offending Baal. And if we read the earth of them, then things will, be, will return back to normal. Are you with me? It has happened before. And the Bible says, the thing that has been is that which shall be. So if you, if you want to understand what is going to be, you need to understand what it has been. If you read also, if you read history, you will know that there is a man called Dr. Philip Scaff. He writes seven volumes, seven or eight volumes on church history. And if you, if, if you study uh, the, the, the portions where he is just writing about persecutions, the persecutions of the church, you know, there, there he, he, he writes very plainly that sometimes the church actually was accused of the climatic disorders that were taking place. Uh, in Rome at that time. Are you with me? Can you imagine that? Now, history, saints, repeats itself. History, uh, it, it moves in a circular manner. Are you with me? This is how time moves. It moves like this, saints. That's why you have round clocks. It moves like this. So even the events, they move like this. History repeats itself. Now, I want us to see, saints, uh, what has been happening recently. Pope Francis met with a lot of high-ranking scientists and uh, there's a, there's a president, prime minister, and all of these things uh, where they were discussing where they were discussing climate change and the measures that need to be put in in order to combat climate change. There are just certain things that I want to bring to your attention to show you that the fight against climate change, very, very soon, it is going to become very, very moral. Now you think it's just a scientific thing. And you are in for a big surprise, I'm telling you the truth, if you think like that. Notice this. So you see this picture. I have taken this from the website. This is the Holy See. This is, this is, this is what he spoke. Now, here are his words. Look at the, the part I've highlighted. He says, the destruction of the environment is an offense against who? Against God. Do you hear that? So he's basically saying that it is a sin. A sin that is not only personal but also structural, one that greatly endangers all human beings, oh, saints, especially the most vulnerable in our midst, and threatens to unleash a conflict between generations. Do you hear that? Sin or destruction of the environment, how, however you're destroying it, it is a sin. And not only one that is personal, but also structural, and it affects everyone. Meaning, if you continue to destroy the environment, you're actually affecting everyone else. Are you with me? And soon you'll become a marked person if you remain to, to, to continue to do so. Are you with me? Notice this. He says, uh, at the close of his address, he said, There is a need to act with urgency, hmm? compassion, 
and determination since the stakes could not be higher. Since there is a need to act with urgency. With urgency. Urgency is repeated twice. So Pope Francis is saying that this is a sin. So once since the word sin is mentioned, you must know that something has shifted from being political, scientific, to becoming moral. Are you with me? And he says that we need to act urgently, urgently in this matter. Now, do you know what are some of the measures that he wants to introduce in order to combat climate change? Well, saying it's very easy. I'll show you. The 2024 G7 summit in Italy promises to be a pivotal event in shaping a more sustainable future for our planet. As the world's leading economies gather, the agenda will focus on critical issues such as economic resilience, security and ethical AI development. The esteemed participation of Pope Francis will lend a moral voice to discussions on ethical AI development and global cooperation. Artificial intelligence. One of the most significant proposals should be the introduction of a weekly Earth Sabbath to combat climate change. One of the most significant proposals should be the introduction of a weekly Earth Sabbath to combat climate change and promote environmental stewardship. The weekly Earth Sabbath aims to establish a global day of rest and reflection. The weekly Earth Sabbath aims to establish a global day of rest and reflection on environmental sustainability, raising awareness and inspiring collective action. By championing the weekly Earth Sabbath, Italy would position itself as a leader in international diplomacy and environmental sustainability on the global stage. Very soon, there's going to be a G7 summit. I think it's going to be in June, June, sometime in June. And Pope is the first, Pope Francis is the first Pope ever to have attended the G7 summit. Are you with me, saints? Now, as he's the first Pope ever to have attended the summit, in that summit for the very first time also, one of the measures that is introduced to combat climate change, it is a Earth Weekly Sabbath. Are you with me? Do you hear that? It is a Earth Weekly Sabbath. Let me show you. Remember now, he has said we need to act urgently. There is a group that is promulgating the Laudate Si Encyclical. And that Laudate Si Encyclical, it, it speaks about Sunday rest as being one of the ways of combating climate change. Now, these, this group is actually appealing to the Pope to, to, to use his moral influence and authority to get all of the states to actually enforce a weekly, a weekly Earth Sabbath. Are you with me? Where the Earth comes to rest. And they say that this is the easiest way to, to relieve ourselves from climatic disorder. Because when the Earth rests, even if it's one day a week, the carbon emissions, they reduce very drastically. Even Pope himself, during the COVID, he said that the COVID has shown us that the Earth can recover if the earth is allowed to rest. Are you with me? So one of the big, big trump cards in this battle against climate change, it is the issue of allowing the earth to rest. Oh, saints. Is it not coming closer home? Do you not hear echoes of great controversy, page 589 and 590, where we're told that there are going to be a lot of disasters and then Satan is actually going to influence the leaders? And it is going to be declared that it is those who are keeping the seventh day Sabbath who are actually causing these problems. And that these problems won't, be, won't cease until we read these people of the earth. Because these people, by keeping the seventh day Sabbath, they are actually they are bringing disrespect to the weekly earth Sabbath. Hmm? We are offending God by the violation of the Sunday Sabbath. That is what is going to be declared, saints. And that is what we are seeing being stated already now. So we need to wake up, saints. We need to wake up. Let me tell you. In Testimonies to the Church, Volume 7, page 141, we are told that the last act in the drama is going to be the inaction of the Sunday law. And if you see the Sunday law, saints, being so close to being enacted, you must know that the drama is about to end. Saints, we are going home very soon. But are we preparing for that home? Are we preparing for that home, saints? Uh, now, saints, let us, let, us, let us begin with the word of prayer as we enter into our study. Righteous and Holy Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we come before your merciful throne, come before your throne of grace, Lord. 
and we are really pleading for, for strength to overcome the evil one. And at this time, we are pleading for, we are pleading for strength to understand your word. We are pleading for strength, Lord, to do the work that has been appointed to us. And that is to give the warning, to give the message that you have paid in us, Lord. Please, please, Father, help us. Please, Lord, speak through my mouth. I'm just but a child. Nothing, Lord, can come from me that will help anyone except it is proceeding directly from the throne above. I ask, Father, all and for the forgiveness of our sins in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Saints, now before we look at the seed, before we look at the seed, uh, we need to first identify what is the seed. What is the seed? Now, when you read in the book of Luke chapter 18, verse 11, Jesus is very plain in the parable of the, the sower sowing the seed. Uh, he says that uh, the seed is the word of God. Are you with me? And then he says in verse 12 that this seed, he's, this seed is sown upon the heart. Are you with me? So the seed is the word of God and the soil represents the heart. So when you're speaking about soil preparation, you're speaking about heart preparation. So doing things that will prepare the hearts of the people to receive the gospel message. But after the hearts of the people are prepared, you best be assured since they are sowing the right seed. Let me tell you something. You know, we've had an experience. I remember one time we sowed the wrong seed. Now, it wasn't the wrong thing, but the seed was very so defective that after we had sown a huge place here, we had to dig it up again. Now, that is a waste of time. Like I said, since the issue of wasting time is very, very serious. So you, you, you need to understand the message that you are bearing and the message that you ought to give. Are you with me? Also, before we understand the seed, I want us to understand a particular point. And this is the point that God is the one who gives the messengers the message. Are you with me? As a messenger, you are given by God the message that you ought to bear. You don't decide for yourself what to say. Are you with me? But you say what you have been told to say. Is that clear, friends? Let's just look at some verses. Uh, the one that we remember, we remember Matthew 28, uh, in verse 19 and 20. Call ye therefore and make disciples of all nations. Are you with me? And, and then he says, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Are you with me? So Jesus doesn't say, go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations. Mm -mm. Uh, and then teaching them whatever you see fit. Mm -mm. Says, but teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, what I have taught you. Are you with me? So we teach what Jesus has taught us to teach. Now notice also in another place, come with me to the book of Jonah, Jonah chapter 3. In Jonah chapter 3, uh, we are just going to read verse 1, uh, then we are going to read verse 4 and 5. It says, And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. Preach to that city what I tell you to preach. Then the Bible says in verse 4, And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey. And he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Hmm? So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. Let us pause here. Do you see this? God tells Jonah to preach what he tells him to preach. And Jonah does that, saints, and the whole city repents. But did you notice the preaching? It seemed very hard. Are you with me? Very, you know, maybe someone might say it's, it is lacking in compassion. Jonah went into the city, says the city 40 days time is going to be overthrown. It's gone. It's gone. Now, Jonah could have reasoned and said, but Lord, that's too harsh now. Lord, no one is going to believe that. Or oh, Lord, no one, this and this. He might have reasoned other things. He, he might have said, oh, maybe the people of Nineveh, Lord, this is what they like. Maybe let me approach them like this. Maybe let me do... I, I, are you with me, friends? But Jonah preached the preaching that God had bidden him to preach. And the result was amazing. Conversion. Remember, there is no one who knows human hearts than God. Are you with me? And there is no one who wants people to be saved. 
more than God wants them to be saved. So the thing that God gives us to say to people, that is best calculated for the salvation of people. Are you with me, saints? There is no one who wants souls to be saved like Jesus. Jesus has paid for them with his own blood. Are you with me, saints? So we are just best in preaching what God has told us to preach. Now notice in Jeremiah 26, Jeremiah 26, we are going to read verse 2 and verse 3. It says, Thus said the Lord, Stand in the court of the Lord's house, and speak unto all the cities of Judah, which come to worship in the Lord's house, all the words that I command thee to speak unto them. And then it says, Diminish not a word. Are you with me? Now why must he not diminish not a single word? It says, If so be they will hearken, and turn every man from his evil way, that I may repent me from, from the evil which I purpose to do unto them because of the evil of their doings. Are you with me? God says to Jeremiah, speak what I tell you to speak. And then he says, Jeremiah, don't diminish a single word. Now, why is he saying that? Very simple things. It is because God knew that the temptation of the human heart, it is to diminish certain things from what God has spoken, certain things that we deem too hard, or maybe these things will be too hard for people to accept, or whatever the case may be. That is why God said to Jeremiah specifically, don't diminish anything. If God did not see that there is a chance that Jeremiah might diminish something, God would not given would have given this warning. So the reason why God is saying, don't diminish anything, God foresees, God can see, saints, the weakness of the human heart, how, the, how that we want to diminish from the message of the Lord sometimes. We are, we, are, we are chopping and cutting certain things that we think are hard for people to receive. And that is a danger. Because God says, if you give it like that as it is, then, verse 3, there will be an opportunity for people to repent. So that I can also repent of the evil that I purpose to do unto them because of their evil doings. Do you hear that? So since I think the point is clear, as a messenger, you need to speak the message that God has given to you. Now, what is our message in these last days? What is our message in these last days? Come with me to Revelation chapter 14. Let us read now verse 14. Revelation 14, verse 14. And I looked and behold a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is what? Is ripe. Are you with me? Now notice this, saints. In verse 14 and 15, we are given a particular picture. What picture is this of? Like, what is this speaking about? Well, it's speaking about the second coming, saints. Jesus sitting upon the clouds, number one, and also the picture of him reaping, because the harvest of the earth is ripe. That is clearly referring to the second coming. In fact, Jesus uses the similar words in Matthew 24, in verse, 14, in, in verse 30. Matthew 24, verse 30. When Jesus says, And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with the power and great glory. Are you with me? So this, the second coming of Jesus says that he's going to be coming with the clouds. And again here we see the Son of Man coming with the clouds. Are you with me? And he's coming not now to judge or to do what, but he's coming to reap. Hmm? So this is definitely the second coming of Jesus. All right. Now, what days do you call uh, the days which preceded the second coming of Jesus? It is the, the last days. Are you with me, saints? So now, the days that precede the second coming of Jesus, it is the last days. So if you want to understand which message must, pre must be preached in the last days, in our days, then we need to look at the book of Revelation again and see whether we cannot find a message that was preached before the second coming of Jesus. Before verse 14 and 15. Is there a message that is being preached before verse 14 and 15? Yes. What message is that? The three angels' messages. Let's look at it. From verse 6 now. It says, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation 
and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and the earth and the seas and the fountains of waters. It continues and says, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Are you with me? Continues the third angel's message. And it says, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead, on his right hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. Are you with me? And it continues all the way to the time of the second coming of Jesus in verse 14. So this threefold message, saints, is the last message upon the earth. This is the last message upon the earth. This is so clear to see when you're looking at it from Revelation 14. Are you with me, saints? So this is the seed. This is the message that we ought to preach. Now, I want to show you something remarkable. Turn with me to Matthew 24. Matthew 24 and verse 14, it says, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, then shall the end come. Now, the reason why I have asked you to turn to Matthew 24, although I know that many of you have memorized the verse, which is a good thing we ought to. The reason why I, I want you to turn this because I want us to underline a few things in that verse. First of, first of all, it says, and this gospel of the kingdom. Now, when, when Jesus says, and this gospel, he is being specific. Now, I want to suggest to you that the gospel that I was referring to here, it is the three angels' messages, because we know that this is the gospel, this is the message that is preached just before the coming of Christ. Are you with me? Now, I want us to see uh, how easily we can see that in Matthew 24. He says this specific gospel, not any gospel, but this specific gospel is going to be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. Are you with me? And then shall they end come. Now, they, there are two alls there. All the world, all nations. That is where the gospel of the kingdom is going. So there's an emphasis of this gospel going to the whole world. Did you not see that in the strangers' messages? Don't you remember seeing that? It says... And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation, and kindred, and tongue, and people. Are you with me? So the three angels' message is just like the message that Jesus is referring to here, as the last message upon the earth, as the gospel of the kingdom. The three angels' messages, it is a global message. It is not preached to just one race or tribe or nation. Are you with me? Do you think that it is a coincidence that God has put these similarities in, the, in these two verses? No, saints. God wanted us to see that the three angels' messages, this is the final message of mercy to a perishing world. Not only that, Jesus says here that when this gospel of the kingdom is preached, then the end comes. Are you with me? So, likewise, in Revelation chapter 14, after the three angels' message is preached, in verse 14 and 15, then the end comes, then Jesus comes. Are you with me? Then Jesus comes. So, so, so far we see that the ranger's message says it is a direct hand and glove fit with the gospel of the kingdom, which Jesus says is going to be preached in the end of time. Now, this gospel of the kingdom was also preached by Jesus, but in a format or in a way that was suited for his time when he was upon the earth. That's why it's referred to in verse 6 of Revelation 14 as the everlasting gospel. Are you with me? So it's the same gospel of the kingdom. Now I want us to see how Jesus preached it. Mark 1 verse 14 and 15. It says, Now after that John was put into prison. Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. Hmm? And saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. So we see that when Jesus was preaching the gospel of the kingdom, one of the elements of the gospel of the kingdom was that a, it was preached using time. Are you with me? And the time that Jesus was referring to was the time in Daniel chapter 9, saints. So the gospel of the kingdom also has time prophecy, meaning it is based on the prophecies. Whenever Jesus was preaching, saints, he would quote now and again, from the prophecies of the Old Testament, even when he had resurrected. You remember in Matthew, in Luke 24, when speaking to his disciples, the Bible says, Ought not the Christ to have suffered and then enter into his glory? Then it says in verse 25, 
Luke 24, verse 25, says, And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Are you with me? So Jesus taught the gospel using prophecy. Hmm? So saints, the gospel of the kingdom is a prophetic message. Are you with me? So if it has no prophecy, it is not the gospel of the kingdom. And do you see how much prophecy is in the, is in the three angels' messages, saints? Do you see that? So this is definitely a hand and glove fit. This is the message, saints. Lastly, we see that Jesus in preaching the gospel of the kingdom, he's calling people to repent. To repentance. Does the three angels' message call people to repentance? Yes. The three angels' message says it is it cannot be preached by motivational speakers. Motivational speakers are supposed to motivate people. That is what they do. Now, Satan wants you, who is called to bear this message, to be turned to just a motivational speaker, where you speak and motivate and motivate and say nothing about sin. Do you hear that, saints? Say nothing about sin and its dreadful results. But saints, the three angels' message doesn't go like that. It needs to point out sin. And as it points out sin, it also points out the remedy for sin. But sin must be rebuked. Sin must be pointed out, saints. This issue of preaching the gospel of the kingdom while people are in fornication in church and still there is no conviction that the person is living in danger. Someone is not paying tithe. Someone is working on the Sabbath. Someone is in, a, is, is, is in an ungodly relationship. They are in danger. People are continuing to watch televisions. And you are just busy motivating and motivating and motivating and closing your Bible and you go. That is not the gospel of the kingdom. I am telling you the truth, saints. Can I please show you something? Let me just show you something. You remember John the Baptist? Now we have done studies previously to show that John the Baptist is actually a type of what we ought to be as Seventh-day Adventists upon the earth. Now, notice John the Baptist. I'm going to begin where it says, when his voice. This is now in Deserve Ages, page 224. It says, when his voice, that is John, when his voice was heard in the wilderness, saying, prepare ye the way of the Lord, and make his paths straight. It says, Satan feared for the safety of his kingdom. Do you hear that? We're told that when John was pre preaching the gospel, Satan trembled. He feared for the safety of his kingdom. Don't you want to preach in a way that causes Satan to be afraid? Hmm? Or do you want to preach in a way that causes Satan to smile and laugh? Because all of these motivational talks, Satan is just smiling. Because that's it. Sinners are being motivated so that they are not discouraged in the things of life. That's it. Keep them like that. Don't tell them anything about sin. Satan is happy about motivational speaking. Now, what is it that caused Satan to fear for the safety of his kingdom when John the Baptist was speaking? Notice it continues. It says, The sinfulness of sin was revealed in such a manner that man trembled. Are you with me? It says, Satan's power over many who had been under his control was broken. Hmm? So the three angels' message says, leave it as it is. Don't diminish a single word. The reforms that are there. The things that we ought to do that are written that message says, don't diminish from them. Are you with me? Satan wants people to be lulled to sleep. But God wants people to be woken up. God wants people to be woken up so that they may strive to enter in in the straight gate. Because many, I'm telling you, saints, who are going to desire to enter in and shall not be able. Are you with me? All right. So we have seen now that the gospel of the kingdom is a hand and glove fit with the three angels' messages. Now, saints, I want to reveal the secret ingredient that leads people to, to conversion and to repentance. Let me ask before, before we just look at it. Since we see that this message is to lead people to repentance, is there anything since that we remember that leads people to repentance in the Bible? What is it that leads people to repentance? 
maybe while they're still thinking about it, you know, I'm, I'm remembering this quotation that I wanted to show. Because you see, people since they're really taking this for granted. Let me just show these quotations quickly, and then we're going to come back to that. Hold that thought. What is it that leads people to repentance? Let's just continue with the trainer's message. I want us to see from inspiration that this is our message. Notice this. Testimonies to the Church, Volume 9, page 19. It says, In a special sense, Seventh-day Adventists have been set in the world as watchmen and light bearers. Huh? says, To them has been entrusted the last warning for a perishing world. Huh? says, They have been given a work of the most solemn import, the proclamation of the first, second, and the third angel's messages. There is no other work of so great importance. They are to allow how many things now? Nothing else to absorb their attention. Do you hear that? Nothing should be able should be allowed to divert our attentions from this message, saints, and from the proclamation of this message. Do you remember Noah? Do you think Noah preached? Yes, he preached. The Bible calls Noah a preacher of righteousness. That means he preached. How long did he preach now, saints? He preached 120 years. The same message, yes. He didn't change. You can just imagine it in your own mind. In one part, in the beginning, or in the end, or sometimes the entire message, no one would give the urgent warning of a coming flood and that people should seek their refuge in God and repent from their sins and enter the ark. Are you with me? 120 years. There are so many things that happen within the space of 120 years. So many modern things come up. So many things, saints. But Noah did not change his message. You see this issue of trying to modernize our message. It is not of God, saints. It is not of God. It is of the enemy of souls. Because he's trying to lead us to divert from the true, unadulterated message of the gospel. We are told that as Seventh-day Adventists, we are given, saints, this is the last message of mercy to a perishing world. Satan knows that without this message, the world does not receive the message of mercy. Are you with me? And we are told that we are to allow, allow nothing to absorb our attention. All right. I love this quotation as well. Last day events, page 168. It says, in, this, in these last days, it is our duty to ascertain the full meaning of the first, second, and the third angel's messages. Eh? It says, these... Messages were presented to me as an anchor to the people of God. Let's pause here. We are told our duty is to ascertain the full meaning. You know, saints, I wish very soon to begin a series on the strangers' messages. We have been doing these series for so long, uh, but saints, we will not see it until Jesus returns. I wish to begin a series on the strangers' messages so that we see uh, what it really means. Because we are told that we have, all of us, a duty to what? To ascertain, not the partial meaning, the full meaning of the first. If I can ask you, what is the full meaning of the first message? What is the full meaning of giving glory to God? What is the full meaning of, of fearing God? What is the full meaning of worshipping God? I, 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 are you with me, saints? What is the full meaning of Babylon falling? What are the lessons that we are getting? The personal lessons that we ourselves are getting from that. Oh, saints, we need to go deeper. We're told we need to ascertain the full meaning of the first, second, and third. Do you understand the beast? Do you understand his image? Do you understand his mark? Are you with me? Do you understand how these things are going to transpire? Do you understand how to escape? Do you understand the faith of Jesus? Because the message, saints, it doesn't end with the beast and his image and his mark. It ends with the faith of Jesus. Do you understand righteousness by faith? We are told that we need to understand. We need to understand, saints, the full meaning of these messages. And we're told that if we do this, saints, we're told that these messages, they, they, they are like an anchor to God's people. Hmm? You know, an anchor is what keeps the ship when it is, you know, packed uh, uh, to, to, to be swept with the wind, by the wind, as the winds move. The anchor keeps it stable. Are you with me? Now, we're told that these messages are, were represented to the prophet of God as an anchor. Do you have an anchor? Do you have an anchor? Are you with me? Now we're told here in the blue words, those who understand and receive them will be kept 
from being swept away by the many delusions of Satan. Are you with me? There are so many delusions now. I will not mention a single one, lest saints uh, there be a lot of controversy again. But there are just so many delusions flying around. And I'm telling you, we are told that if we understood the full meaning of these messages, saints, we would be kept from the many delusions of Satan. Now, because we don't, the delusions come and they find a responding code within our hearts. And saints, I really desire to do the series on the strangers' messages because everyone who brings a delusion, somehow, somewhere, they try to fit it in and to force it in and to, to squeeze it in the strangers' messages. And somehow it is part of it. I, <laughs> saints, I am telling you the truth. We are in for it. If we don't understand what we are supposed to be preaching. We are really in for it. If you don't understand these messages, I'll tell you, you don't have an anchor. You can go to a particular camp meeting, you can hear a particular message, and you can be swept away. I'm telling you the honest, honest truth. So we ought to understand these messages, saints. Fully, we are told to ascertain. Hmm? All right. Now, I want to show you something. Ever since I began preaching these messages, uh, I realized that when you preach them in the way that they are given in the Bible, in the spirit of prophecy, you become a marked man in the church. So I always like to show this. This, saints, is our fundamental beliefs. We are told in fundamental belief number 13 that actually as a church, as the remnant church, we are given the work of the proclamation of these messages. Are you with me? So this is actually what our church, this is what we are supposed to be doing. Now the fact that you don't hear these messages from the pulpits, you don't hear these messages from, you know, from, like, like you have to know, hear them any, anywhere. Even in our evangelistic meetings, you, you, you hear it now. Our evangelistic meetings now, they're just motivational speaking. I am telling you the truth. The fact that you don't hear all of these things, it shows that you have backslidden saints. But here it is on record. This is now, if someone challenges you and says, mm, don't preach about that, don't, don't tell us about the third angel's message. Don't tell us about preparation. Just open this belief to them. Number 13. Say, sir, elder, tell me, wh were you baptized? Yes. All right. Now, with all due respect, with all due respect and the humility of Christ, I just want to show you, elder, that also when I was baptized, this is what I was baptized into. That I must preach this message. Now, as I'm studying this message, this is what I find. Are you with me? And I'm just trying to do what I vowed to do, to preach this message. Please, my elder, please, my pastor, have mercy on me. Try and reconsider what you are saying. Try and reconsider what you are fighting against. Lest peradventure you are found to be fighting against God himself. Now, saints, I want to come back to the issue of repentance now. This message is calling people to what? To repentance. Are you with me? Now, what is it that leads people to repentance? Romans chapter 2 verse 4. It says that what leads people to repentance is the what? It is the, the goodness of God. Are you with me, saints? It is the goodness of God. Now, saints, the goodness of God is revealed in many ways. It's revealed in many ways. But you need to understand that as a bearer of this message who is trying to lead people to repent, if you are not revealing the goodness of God, there is no way that you are going to have success in giving this message. Are you with me? Because what leads people to repentance, it is the, the goodness of God. All right? Then... The goodness of God, saints, you need to understand now how it is, is revealed. Many ways, God reveals his goodness for us or towards us by protecting us, by giving us food, uh, giving us shelter, all of these things, in clothing. But you know that the ultimate revelation and expression of God's goodness was revealed on the cross when Jesus hung naked, wet with blood for our sins, not for his sins. Are you with me? The goodness of God, the ultimate expression, it is God giving his only begotten son to die for a sinner. I say for a sinner because since when Jesus died, he died for you individually. When God gave his only begotten son, do you know that when God gave Jesus, he gave the only thing that he has one of. Everything else God has in abundance. Do you know that? Gold and silver is abundant. Angels are abundant. The world is abundant. Like everything. Jesus is the only thing that God has won off. Mm. And that is the one thing that required 
And that is the one thing that was required for us to be saved. And God gave his son. You know, we're told in the book, Patriots and Prophets, that it was a struggle, even with the king of the universe, to give up his son. Are you with me? So since that is the ultimate revelation of the love of God, and Jesus coming to die. Now I want us to understand maybe very briefly, why did Jesus have to die? Why did Jesus have to die? Well, the Bible in Romans 6 verse 23, it says, the wages of sin is what? It is death. Hmm? It is death. So when you have sinned, you are supposed to die. So when you, when you have sinned, you basically owe, and the debt is your life. You owe with your life. So if you are to try and pay your debt, basically you you would die, you would cease to exist forever. Are you with me? So in other words, you really, really can't afford to pay your debt. But the debt stands. When you have sinned, you owe, and the debt is your is your life. You can only pay with your life. Are you with me, saints? Now, not only that, everyone has sinned and everyone is supposed to be dead. Everyone is owing. Are you with me? And in order for us, saints, to be freed from this debt because we can afford it, someone must pay it for us. But now the person who's going to pay the debt for us must not themselves be owing because you, because you can't pay a debt while you yourself are owing. Are you with me? So the person must be sinless, sin-free. But there is no human. There is no human who could do that because all the humans had fallen into sin. Everyone had sinned. Romans now, 3 verse 23. Everyone has sinned. Are you with me? Angels had not sinned. Now here we get to some people possibly who could pay the debt. Now let's say possibly, now let's say, let's say if angels could pay the debt, let's say possibly they could pay the debt. You know what the problem would be? The angel in his sinless state, if they could pay the debt, they could pay, they could pay just for one person. Are you with me? Because the angel is, is one, one individual, has one life. So he can only pay for one life as well. Are you with me, saints? But in all essence, an angel cannot pay the debt because the angel's life does not belong to the angel. So he cannot use what is not his to pay. Are you with me? Now, in order for the debt to be paid, there must be someone who has not sinned. And there must be someone who has more than one life. There must be someone who has more than two lives. There must be someone who has eternal life because they are paying for all the humans have ever existed. Are you with me? They are paying the sin, the sin penalty, the penalty for sin for every human has ever existed. Are you with me? So those are the two requirements that you must be sinless and have eternal life. Now, those, those attributes, saints, they only exist with the Godhead. So Satan, when men had fallen into sin, Satan thought that there was no way of escape because like there are, he thought that there is no way that God could descend from the throne of the universe to come and pay the penalty for man's transgression, which requires death. No ways. Are you with me? That is why we are told, saying that when Jesus came to the earth, Satan was amazed. Satan was amazed. Listen to this quotation. Desire of Ages, page 115. It says, Satan well knew the position that Christ had held in heaven as the beloved of the Father. Then it says that the Son of God should come to this earth as a man, filled him with amazement and apprehension. He could not fathom the mystery of this great sacrifice. He could not understand such love for the deceived race. Are you with me, saints? We are told that the, the, just the simple fact of, of, of Christ leaving heaven and coming to this earth as a man. We're told that that filled Satan with amazement. You know when something amazes you, it means you did not expect it. Hmm? Just Jesus leaving heaven, coming to this earth as a man. We're told since the, the sacrifice was so amazing that we're told it was a mystery to him. We're told he could not fathom the mystery of this great sacrifice. Are you, are you with me? You know when something is so amazing, it is mysterious. Now, this is, Satan was just looking at Jesus coming down from heaven. Not even Jesus dying yet. Just descending from the throne of the universe. We are told he could not fathom. Would like, how can it be? And the quotation continues. It says, 
the glory and peace of heaven and the joy of communion with God were but dimly comprehended by men, but they were well known to Lucifer, the covering cherub. Now, let me tell you, saints, why to Satan uh, Jesus coming to the earth was such a great sacrifice to the point where it is actually mysterious. It, 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 it is not understandable that someone could make such a sacrifice. There are two reasons. The first one is given in the beginning of the quotation. It says, Satan well knew the position that Christ had held in heaven as the beloved of the Father. So his knowledge of the position of Christ in heaven, like that is what also confused him a lot when Jesus would step down from such a position to come on the earth and become a man, a child, a, and be born where animals are born. Are you with me? Like this was the mystery of mysteries to Lucifer. Saints, not the death yet, just the descent from the throne. Are you with me? And the second thing that is mentioned in the quotation that caused Satan to really not understand this, this step down was that heaven is a beautiful place. We are told that the glory and the peace of heaven and the joy of communion with God were but dimly comprehended by men, but they were well known to Lucifer, the covering cherub. Satan knows how beautiful and how joyful and how peaceful heaven is. Are you with me? And that someone would choose to come to this place, would choose to leave heaven and come to this place. Like it was almost unbelievable that he would voluntarily do this. Like even when Satan began the warfare in heaven, do you know that he did not want to leave heaven? That's how happy heaven is. The Bible says that he was cast out. That's Revelation 12 verse 8. He was thrown out of heaven, saints. Are you with me? He did not voluntarily say, I'm leaving heaven now. But before he was thrown out, it is because his heart was no longer the heart of heaven. So he had to depart even with his body. Are you with me? So heaven is a joyful place. Do you remember if you have read the visions of Ellen White? Her vision of heaven when she was taken to heaven in vision. You know what she says? She says that she begged the angel that she might not return to the earth. Are you with me? This is a person who had loved ones upon the earth. This is a person who was here who had family. Hmm? But when she was taken to heaven, she said, let me, let me remain here. My loved ones, they can join me sometime later. Can I please remain here? And, and the angel says, mm -mm, you will also come here when you are faithful. Now you need to go back and proclaim. Are you with me? So that, that should just give you a glimpse of how beautiful heaven is. That someone once in vision shown heaven, they are desiring, begging not to go back to the, <laughs> to the earth. <laughs> Saints, so heaven is a beautiful place. It is not easy to leave heaven. Yet we are told in Desire of Ages, page 416, that Jesus did not count heaven a place to be desired while we were lost. Do you hear that? Do you hear that, saints? Heaven, as beautiful as it is, it's like it, it lost its attraction so long as we were lost. The heart of Jesus was with the sons of men. And since this is the love that draws us to God and that draws us away from sin, this is the love that leads us to repentance. And as we study at the plan of redemption, this love is revealed more and more and more and more. Are you with me? So this is my point in summary and as we're about to close. Our message, saints, is the trainer's messages. But as we give the three angels messages, we should be giving the three angels messages with the cross at the center. Are you with me? With the cross at the center. Always. Do you know that in all the quotations, almost in all the quotations where Ellen White is actually urging us to teach and preach prophecy, she does not forget to, to remind us to preach about Jesus. In Gospel Workers, page 148, she says that ministers should, pe should present the sure word of prophecy as the foundation of the faith of Seventh-day Adventists. Are you with me? She says, let the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation be preached and with them, uh, in con and in connection with them, the words, behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. Are you with me? Another one in testimonies, to ministers and gospel workers, page 118, says, 
It says, let Daniel speak, let the revelation speak and tell what is truth. It says, but whatever phase of the subject is presented, always uplift Jesus as the center of all hope, the root and offspring of David. Are you with me? So as we preach these prophetic messages, saints, they need to be peeping behind the cross of Calvary. They need to be peeping behind the redemption plan. Are you with me? So in everything, we need to be showing the plan of redemption, that mysterious outworking of how God, through great sacrifice, even at the risk of failure and eternal loss, wants to redeem man, saints. Are you with me? The redemption plan is the central theme of the whole Bible. But the central theme of the entire redemption plan, it is the love of God. Are you with me? So as this message, the train's message is going forward, saints, it needs to go forward, encapsulated, I don't know how can I put it, saints, words fail me. It just needs to go forward dipped in blood. Are you with me? It must be wet with the blood of Jesus. The love of Christ and God must be expressed in everything that we do and say, saints. Are you with me? So this is, this is something that we need to learn. This is something that we need to pray for. And we don't have much time. Like we saw now in, in some of the signs that we're just looking at, we don't have much time, saints. So may God really help us, saints, to, to embrace this seed. To embrace this seed and to give this seed, to plant this seed in the hearts of people. Are you with me? There are many precious truths in the word of God, but it is present truth that the flock needs right now. Are you with me? There's a lot of danger, saints, when we go away from the important points of present truth and dwell upon points that are not calculated to unite the flock or to sanctify the soul. Are you with me, saints? So we need to embrace this message. We need to embrace it. Let us, let us pray. Let's close in prayer. Righteous Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you, Lord, for the message that you have given to us. We thank you, Lord, for speaking to us thus. And we are really pleading, Lord, in a very, very special way, in a special sense that you please help us to ascertain the full meaning of the first, second, and third angel's messages. And help us, Lord, at each and every point as we study these wonderful messages, to study them in light of the great redemption plan, to strive to see your love, Lord, in everything that we do and that we say and that we read. Please, Lord. Help us to, to see things in a completely different light uh, to that we see it in. May this message lead people to repentance and may it lead them to willingly obey, not to yield forced obedience or to be manipulated or to be frightened into obedience, but may, the, but may their hearts be melted by the love of Jesus and led obedience. Please, Lord, we ask and beg all in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And as for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. I want to be just.